Welcome back ladies and gentlemen. In this video, we're going to be addressing Jake the Metaphysician, who I very briefly had an encounter with, sort of at a distance, back when he came to Speaker's Corner and had a debate with Bob. Now Jake has made a video on his channel where he addresses what seems to be the ongoing conversation that Farid is having with his channel, which is determining how Muslims can deal with the Islamic dilemma. And for those of you who don't know, the Islamic dilemma is where Muslims open the Quran and realize they've been lied to. <laughs> it's where Muslims read the Quran and they realize there are statements in the Quran that affirm the previous scriptures, namely the Injil and the Torah, to such a high level that it becomes implausible to say that the Quran doesn't affirm the Injil and the Torah. And we know what the Injil and the Torah were in the historical context of Muhammad's time. We know who the Christians and the Jews Muhammad was speaking to, according to the Islamic tradition. Therefore, we can determine that Muhammad affirms our scriptures in a partial sense, at least with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and the first five books of Moses. Now, as David Wood and others have pointed out, this is a big favor of Christian apologists because, I mean, it's not even just Christian apologists, it's, it's basically anyone who's not a Muslim. We love this argument because it's so quick and easy to show and because there is so little in what Muslims can respond with. And that's kind of where we get to today with the video from Jake the Metaphysician. He has made a response video, which as far as I'm concerned is just admitting defeat. It's, it's just a very low energy, look guys, Ultimately, we're going to take this methodology, hell or high water. We don't care if the Christians are going to critique it. We don't care if anyone who's not a Muslim is going to critique it. We don't care if it's not very plausible. We don't care if it's not very likely. We don't care if it's riddled with issues. We're going to go with it because we don't have another choice. And this, my friends, is the dilemma that we see Muslims in today. So let's get to the video. The common claim from these Christian apologists or Islamophobes. Really, Jake? We're five seconds into the video and you're already coming out with things like Islamophobe. Come on, Jake. Remember, guys, if you're trying to make an argument in favor for Islam and it's going terrible, it's going horribly wrong, you want to get out of there, you don't know what to do, just call everyone you're debating with Islamophobes. It's a quick, simple, and track record approved way of winning an argument. Today we have to debunk a common Christian apologetic about Islam. Now, what is it? Here's the question. Does the Quran affirm the current Bible that we have today as the uncorrupted word and revelation of God? Yes, Jake. If by Bible you mean the Torah and the Injil, then yes, the Quran absolutely does affirm the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Torah and the Injil that we have today. Because the Quran in Surah Al Imran, Ayah 3, says that Allah revealed the Torah and the Injil and the Quran. So that demonstrates that the Torah and the Injil are inspired. Now, how do we know that that Torah and that Injil that is being mentioned here is the same Torah and Injil that Muhammad has in his current day that he is engaging with regarding Christians and Jews? We know this because of verses like Sul al Baqarah, Ayah 41, which says, And believe in what I have sent, I am confirming that which is already with you. Or in Sul al Baqarah, Ayah 89, which says, And when there came to them a book, i.e. the Quran, from Allah, confirming that which was with them. Okay then, so the Torah and the Injil at the time of Muhammad was inspired by Allah. Great. But how do we know it's preserved? Well, partly because verses like the ones I just gave demonstrate that the Torah and Injil are still around at the time of Muhammad. Muhammad makes no distinction between different Torahs or different Injils. There is only one Torah and there is only one Injil. And that is the one of which he said has come from Allah and hence is inspired by God. Muhammad could have made a distinction and said, well, actually, there's a corrupt Injil over here. There's a corrupt Injil over here. But the true Injil is this one and likewise for the Torah, but he never does that. In fact, in the Quran, there is no distinction between different kinds of Torahs and different kinds of Injils. There is only the inspired, preserved, and authoritative Torah and Injil. We can know that the Torah has been preserved also by the fact that the Christians are held accountable, and so are Jews, to their prior scriptures, the Torah and the Injil. I am going to be saying Torah and Injil a lot during this video. And so al Maida Ayah 44, we see an account where Muhammad is being asked to give judgment to some Jews, but he in effect refuses to judge because they already have the Torah, which contains Allah's judgment with them. Such a thing wouldn't be possible if the Torah hadn't been preserved. The first thing that Muhammad should have said, or Allah should have revealed through Muhammad, is that the Jews cannot use the Torah they have with them because it's been corrupt, and therefore some of the laws are not valid. And to to be perfectly frank, if a 
text has been universally textually corrupt, then, then it's not a Torah anymore anyway. It's just a cheap imitation. But according to the Quran, there is no attention paid to such an idea. The Torah is valid for use in judgment. Next, we can look at Surah Al-Maida verse 47, which makes it clear that the people of the Injil should judge by that Injil. And that those who fail to judge by what's in the Injil, from the people of the Injil, from me, basically Christians, you're basically going to be held accountable and be considered one of the disbelievers. Now, in order for Christians around the world, because again, the Quran is for mankind, it's not just for the Arabs, it's for everyone, that includes Christians. So when it addresses Christians and says they have to judge by the Injil, again, no mention of multiple Injils, there is supposedly only one correct, inspired, preserved, and authoritative Injil, which Muhammad in his own lifetime addresses to Trinitarian Christians of the Orthodox Oriental Church, for example, he tells them to judge by it, and that would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, if it wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then we have a problem, because now we have to explain why Allah is holding Christians account to judge by something which they don't even have, or have no knowledge of. It makes no sense for Allah to hold Christians morally accountable, and hence have moral duties, to follow a law that he has revealed through the angel, if the vast majority of the world, and by that I would probably say, around 98% or thereabouts, don't actually have this supposed Injil that seems to only be located in the Hejaz. This would call into question whether Allah is ignorant of what the Injil is, hint hint, kind of looks that way, or if he's just cruel and vindictive and wants to punish Christians for something that isn't in their control. We also find this repeated in Surah Al-Maidah 68. Again, very similar message. Christians don't stand on anything unless they stand on the gospel, unless they stand on the Injil. You have to follow the Injil, otherwise you are considered a disbeliever in the sight of Allah. That's a pretty big claim if the Injil that the Christians have in the vast majority of Christendom at this point in history is not the one that Allah is talking about. Which is why I think it's very clear that Muhammad is actually talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Otherwise you need to go down a road that ultimately leads to conspiratorial thinking. You have to think that there was a super secret Injil no one knew about it. Only the Arabs in the Hejaz knew about it in Mecca and Medina. And only these small group of Christians knew about this in jail. And they had the truth with them. The rest of the world didn't have it for some reason. Allah never tells us about this in the Quran. He just calls it a singular Injil that supposedly every Christian is meant to follow. But anyway, it's only these Arabs that have access to it. And this comes under the last category as well as authoritative. These verses make it clear that Christians are held to this law, so the law must be authoritative. Now you can say, oh, but the Quran, it comes in and it's, a, and it's a criteria above the previous scriptures. Right, but for 600 years at least, it wasn't. So for 600 years, that Injil is still binding, even though, according to Muslims who adopt some kind of conspiratorial universal corruption theory, you would have to explain how Christians have still been held accountable for that period of time when they never had access to the uncorrupted version of Allah. It's also clear that Muhammad had the ability to ask Christians for knowledge about certain things. Surah 10, Ayat 94 makes that quite clear, where Muhammad is told that he can ask the people of the book for, for information if he needs to. Again, that would only be viable if they had correct, valid commandments and laws from God. If he didn't, then, well, why is he asking them? For the sake of argument, let's assume that the Qur'an does claim the Bible is the uncorrupted revelation of God. In that case, we shouldn't expect the Qur'an to constantly and purposefully correct the Bible now, should we? Not unless the Quran wants to contradict itself or demonstrate very quickly that it has no idea what is actually in the written texts. And here lies the meat of Jake's argument, the, the absolute brilliance that is. Like, we're on a new level of dawah here. The Quran is correct and can both confirm the scriptures at Muhammad's time, the Torah and the Angel, but also contradict them because by contradicting them, it's a super secret way of letting you know that these verses are corrupt and the Quran is actually just rectifying them. Yeah, this is this is scraping the bottom of the barrel. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like, guys. Like, there's nothing left here. It's just, the Quran is true. The Quran affirms the Injil and the Torah. The Quran contradicts the Injil and the Torah. How do we know that the Quran has not made an error? Because the Quran is true. <laughs> Very simply, when you assume the validity and the truthfulness of your own religion as a starting point, for where you ultimately end up with, which is that Islam is correct and true and is really from Allah, then it is just 
a big circle. Nothing interesting or no arguments have been made here. It is purely the fact they double down. The text itself must be superior because it must be true and therefore it must supersede over prior scriptures. Even though this book also affirms those prior scriptures as also being just as true and correct and valid and authoritative and preserved. So for the rest of Jake's video, basically he just gives instances where the Quran says has the same account as the Injil or Torah, but then the Quran changes the details. And his whole argument is this must be intentional because the Quran must know more than the previous writers did. Therefore, we're just going to double down on that. It's true because it says it is. It's true because it's written in our book. But here's a radical thought for you, Jake. Maybe the Quran is actually largely oral traditions. As many scholars have pointed out, for example, Gabriel Reynolds or others who have said the actual style of writing in the Quran reveals most of it comes from an oral tradition, not from a written tradition. And since the Quran is largely composed of oral traditions, we happen to know that oral traditions have certain properties that are inherent to cultures that practice largely transmitting information orally. One such property is the fact that you often get very in the stories you tell if you only have an oral tradition because there is no written tradition to solidify the exact text or the exact recitation of that oral tradition. For example, Dr. Shady Nasser in his first book, The Transmission of the Variant Readings of the Quran, compared different oral traditions in pre-Islamic Arabia and noticed that there was a high level of oral variants in these Arab poems. He then compared this to the Quran or the Qur'a, the different readings of the Quran, because there are many Qur'ans in Arabic, and realized you can make correlations between these two because since the Quran is largely based from old traditions, not an already written down text, we shouldn't be surprised to see that there are oral variants. Now think of it this way, based on Shady Nasser's work demonstrating that even pre-Islamic Arab poems had oral variants, we shouldn't be surprised that the Quran, as primarily a collection of oral traditions, also has variants. These variants would include things like stories from prophets of the Torah, stories of Jesus, stories of Mary, and so on and so forth. So to even expect there to be one-to-one -one parity, given that the Quran has no text to go off. Remember, most scholars agree now that there wasn't a Arabic translation of the Bible until after Muhammad. So they don't have an Arabic text of the scriptures of the Torah and the Injil to work from. They don't exist. So they're hearing stories of the Torah, they're hearing stories of the Injil, and then they're passing them on orally with slight variants. Just like Dr. Shady Nasser, a scholar at Harvard, had demonstrated by doing comparisons with early Islamic poetry that also had oral variants. Or hey, maybe Jake's right. Maybe this is just Allah's very confusing and contradicting way of telling us that the Quran got it right and earlier scriptures, which he affirmed, got wrong. You can go and watch this video and look at the examples he gives, but ultimately it all falls under the same category of the Quran says it, therefore it's true. The Quran takes precedence because I say so. The Quran is true because I start with that assumption and you better believe it. Jake has no arguments left. And this is kind of just bad. I mean, imagine if I just did the same but reversed. I just said, look, the Injil and the Torah we know are from God, therefore they must be correct. <laughs> Sorry. Doesn't matter what your Quran says. The Torah and the Injil say something different and the Torah and the Injil we know are obviously right, so... That's your argument done with. We would never allow this from Christians. We would, the Jews would never allow this from Jews. That is not an acceptable way of arguing. It is fallacious, it is circular, and it's lazy and it's tired. Muhammad through his whole career hung out with Trinitarian, Nicene Creed believing Christians and never once, according to any Islamic tradition, bothered to tell them that the Injil he's been talking about is a totally different Injil than they have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as the Orthodox Oriental Church has, that we have manuscripts of that predate Muhammad, never once decided to clarify. Not at all. It's probably because Muhammad thought the Injil was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it's probably the fact that he couldn't read, like we know, most Muslims like to tell us Muhammad was illiterate, he couldn't read or write. So if he couldn't read, then he had no way of first-hand validating what the Injil is. He can only hear the Injil being spoken orally through different people saying potentially different things and trying to put together exactly what is in the text and what isn't. So it seems to me vastly more likely that, given the Islamic paradigm, Muhammad just made an error and didn't realize what he was affirming. And that explains everything. It's very simple. It's It meets the standards of Occam's razor. It doesn't postulate many other crazy theories that involve universal Jewish-Christian cooperation to generally corrupt an entire text. 
in multiple places and in multiple languages, it avoids that problem completely. So based on the principle of Occam's razor alone, we should not multiply conditions beyond necessity and we should simply go with the simpler, less complex solution. Namely, that Muhammad did not understand what he was affirming. He thought the written Inju and the written Torah said different things. And that's of course if there actually was a Muhammad, but you know, that's that's a different conversation for a different day. Anyway, this is a short video. God bless you all though. Uh, if you're not a Christian, then today is the day. You can email me at chris at speakerscorner at gmail.com. I will do my best to answer any questions you have about the faith. And other than that, God bless you all. Take care.